Hi everyone, welcome. As an HR manager, one of my biggest frustrations is that very, very few people understand compensation well. And you're gonna listen to me talking for another 15 to 20 minutes about the idea of the different facets of compensation and how it works for every employee and every company. This is gonna be the biggest investment you're gonna make in your life. This 15 minutes is gonna teach you a lot more about compensation than probably anybody has so far. And this will help you on, look at compensation from a very different set of eyes as you sit with me through this presentation. So do make it a point till the last slide that you watch through it completely because you will learn a lot more than you will ever, ever learn. Nobody in HR ever talks about compensation. So that's what I'm trying to bridge during today's conversation. So let's begin by sharing my slide. So this is compensation 101, the very basics which every employee and student should know about. So one word you're gonna hear all the time is about pay grades. So try to understand what a pay grade is. A pay grade is nothing but the range which a company can offer in terms of compensation for a specific role or a position within the company. So there is a maximum for this role. There is a minimum for the role. There's also a midpoint for this role. So this range of compensation depends on the company. It also depends on the external market. So tenure is important. Uh, seniority is important. As you spend more time within the company, you will rise from the minimum of the pay grade to being at the midpoint or close to the maximum of the pay grade. Could even be well above the range of pain. We can talk about the situations later. As you get promoted, you also move across this pay grade and you could even move to the next pay grade or the pay range. This number is gonna also depend a lot on which sector you work in. For example, uh, manufacturing versus IT or tech, there's gonna be a big difference. It depends on which country you are in. If you're working in India, it's different. If you're working in Europe, it's different. If you're working in UK, it's different. It's in US is gonna be different. Even within the US, if you're working in the Bay Area, compensation is gonna be way more than what you would make by say working in say New York or Seattle or Austin or Atlanta and so on. These numbers also get decided during interview process. So managers base their decision on how much to pay employees based on interview performance. And then, then they slot you based on, are they gonna pay you below the midpoint or above the midpoint? So there's a lot, a lot of variability in how this works. Even during the end of the year ratings, the range is very important and that's a big factor for HR to consider when making decisions about compensation. So this table out here, it also shows you that typically when you are hired, people try to slot you at the midpoint or below. And every company does this differently, but um, the minimum number is typically ranges from 80th percentile of the midpoint to, and the maximum goes to the 120 percentage of the midpoint number. So companies play with these numbers. So there is, if you are between the minimum and midpoint, it's, it's typically low. You are lower than the market if the market comparison has been done properly. If you are the midpoint, you're just meeting the market. You are neither low nor high with respect to the market. And if you're above the midpoint, you typically tend to be compensated more than what the market is uh, saying is right for this position. Okay, so when you look at pay grades, this is how an HR leader would look at compensation. So they would look at something called a salary range spread, which is a difference between the maximum and minimum for each pay grade. So these are different pay grades aligned with each other. A very good pay grade progression happens when there's overlap between different pay grades. So this means that high performing people at a lower pay grade could get paid more than a low performing employee or a new employee in the grade above them. So it is not uncommon, for example, for senior some senior managers to be paid more than directors, for some senior engineers to be paid more than a lead engineer and so on. So there's a lot of variability in the way compensation happens. So if somebody tells you they're making so much 
And uh, you can be rest assured that that's probably, if they're doing well, that's probably not a midpoint number. It's going to be probably a very high number. And it's very difficult to make calculations based on just one number because you need to know whether the person is near the maximum, midpoint, or minimum, even before you start digging into compensation. Likewise, um, one common principle used in companies is that they divide the compensate the pay grade or the salary range into four buckets. So they call that first quartile, second quartile, third quartile, and fourth quartile. So the first quartile is between the uh, the, the entry level compensation for the role to the 25th percentile. The second quartile is 25th to the 50th percentile. Third quartile is 50th to 75th percentile. And the fourth quartile is 75th to the maximum number. So you can see that in this picture out here, the grades tend to overlap with each other. There's a lot of overlap from one grade to the other, and this is by design. So there's incentive for people to perform in their jobs and there's also a chance for them as they get promoted to get into a position where they could get paid more or they could decide that no they don't want to get promoted they want to stick around in the same grade and get a much higher compensation but typically when a new hire joins a company they're going to be closer to somewhere near the uh, second quartile or the midpoint and as you grow in a company after many years of work experience, you'd probably land up near the third quartile. And if you're doing extremely well, you could even end up in the fourth quartile or sometimes go to the max. Typically, companies do not pay more than the maximum for the role. And that's something which um, HR managers or leaders rarely talk about. Okay, so we touched on this briefly, but again, if there is no grade overlap, this means that uh, everybody gets a dramatic jump in compensation every time they get promoted from one grade to the other. And by experience, companies have learned that um, there needs to be some overlap between grades because um, you cannot always give very high increases to employees. Uh, and they need to see the increases in the current job before they move to the next job. So the moderate overlap is always more preferred compared to substantial overlap. If there's substantial overlap, when people get promoted, they don't see a substantial change in their compensation numbers. And that could also end up causing a lot of dissatisfaction and heartburn. So you will hear this term compa ratio being used in many companies. So what compa ratio means is that, are you getting paid close to the midpoint for that position? So that's what it means. The compensation you're making divided by the market range into 100. So if you're uh, getting paid um, at a compa ratio of one, it basically means that you're right at the midpoint. And um, if you're getting paid a compa ratio of less than one, that means that you are below the midpoint. And if you have a compa ratio more than one, it means that you're being paid above the midpoint for uh, that pay grade you're in. So again, compa ratio is a very important data point to have when you talk to HR leaders. But off late, a lot of companies have been moving away from compa ratios and entering into more complicated scenarios uh, in terms of how they plan conversations, but this is still a very good number to have. Let's talk about the annual benchmarking exercise of how companies decide compensation and how do they make decisions based on external benchmarking in terms of what is the right way to pay employees? It's very easy for managers, for example, to go and talk to their friends and family members and get data points about how much say uh, is a product manager getting paid in other companies. And they typically come back to HR or compensation and say, hey, all these people are getting paid a lot more. Uh, so why don't you pay a lot more to, uh, to match what others are paying? So the big problem with this approach is that, firstly, compensation is a very, very delicate topic. And uh, this information is pretty much kept confidential by the compensation team. There is a structure in place when it comes to the annual benchmarking exercise. You have to get data points of every single employee who falls into that pay grade within the company, whether he's sitting at the right, he or she is sitting at the top or the bottom. Typically, when you are talking to employees from other places, you are cherry picking data. You are not talking to a representative sample. When I say a representative sample, I'm talking about thousands and if not tens of thousands of data points. 
there's no way any one manager can ever access tens of thousands of data points. Even if they have say an Excel sheet to get data from a bunch of people, it's inherently biased. Only people who are very comfortable with the data points and their compensation numbers tend to post their data online. So you already have a skewed number. There are websites like teamblind.com where you have kids who are straight out of college with one or two years of experience saying that they're getting 400K compensation, 500K compensation, almost half a million dollars of compensation. This could happen for maybe somebody who sits at the 99.9th percentile of the market. But then when you look at these data points, you think that everybody is making this compensation, which is absolutely not true. Every company, whatever, even if it's a FANG company, there are lots of people making well below the, um, the 50th percentile number. Uh, there are people making uh, uh, well above the 50th percentile number. Uh, there are people close to the 90th percentile, the people below the 90th percentile, there is a lot of variability, which basically comes to each company when they decide to tie up with vendors, compensation vendors like Conferry, Hay Group, Mercer, and so on. So if a company decides to go to the annual benchmarking exercise, they tie up with the vendor. The vendor reaches out to a bunch of companies who are considered as competitors for that one company. So they ask for a list of competitors for the company and they get a list. These vendors go to them, ask for the data, they anonymize the data and put it all together. And they don't share that actual data directly with the participant companies or their clients. What they do is that they firstly anonymize it and they have their own way of estimating the skill levels for each role. So every company may have a different grade. They may have a different way of evaluating employees. So a product manager in company X may be equivalent to a senior product manager in a company Y. So to standardize how things work, what a comp these companies and vendors like Conferry do is that they actually have their own internal benchmarks in terms of um, a set of skills and expectations for each pay and level according to their benchmarking. So this compare the compensation and slot it alongside the levels they create from their point of view. So the work of the compensation leader from the company who is a client is to actually get these data points and then look at the job descriptions of the current employees within their own organization and compare it with the conferry description in terms of what the level is and grade is. So they match the skills and try to then map the level within their company to the conferee uh, grades and levels. And then they come up with a detailed description of what these uh, levels are and what the compensation is. So after that point, companies need to make an important decision. Should they lag the market? Should they match the market or should they lead the market? Not every company wants to lead the market because um, compensation is a big part of operating expenses. And you don't want to have a very high number in terms of operating expenses, then you are not going to be profitable. If it's a very profitable company, like a FANG company, yes, you will try to pay employees more because you have a lot of profits and to generate to the, and spread it to the employees. But then if you're not a company making big profits, leading the market doesn't make too much sense. So you probably try to match the market. There are companies who probably lag the market. They say that we are not even gonna pay you till the 50th percentile. We're gonna pay you well below the 50th percentile. And uh, um, they say basically whoever wants to stick around can stick around, those who want to leave can leave. So these companies tend to battle with a lot of turnover. Sometimes the turnover in some of these companies touches like 40% and 50% and so on. And they know it. Uh, so what happens is that they tend to recruit a lot of early in career folks. Uh, they tend to keep them around for a couple of years and they know that everyone is gonna leave someday or the other. So they are well developed learning and development programs and training programs. As people come in, they pick up skills, move on and they move on to the next set of college students coming out or graduating that year, recruit them, put them in. So it's a rotating wheel when it comes to companies who are lagging the market. Now, there are companies which just match the market, which are right at the center, the 50th percentile. 
And uh, there are a lot of tech companies in the Bay Area who also match the market. They don't lead the market or lag the market. And it gets a certain amount of talent. Uh, if you're working in these sort of companies, uh, they give you a lot more stability and you can stick around in the company for much longer. Uh, your job tenure is predicted um, and you get a feeling of um, being around for a long time. You have uh, companions and friends in the company and um, they also don't demand too much work from you. Many, some companies don't demand too much work from you. So you get a, you get some good company, not great compensation, but okay compensation and the work expectations are not that crazy. But if you're working in a company, just say leading the market, for example, Google in one of the recent um, meetings with the CEO uh, had a conversation with the employees where the HR executive said that the Google tends to pay at the 90th or the 95th percentile of the market. So if you want to get into Google, it's a struggle. Not everyone gets into Google. And also once you get into Google, uh, it's, it's a tough thing being there. You, you got to totally outperform everyone else because you got to justify the investment they make in you. So if you're being paid something which is well above market, you also got to justify that yourself and you got to be on your toes and there's no time to relax. You always got to keep running. So those are the cons of getting paid a lot more. So if somebody is looking at online databases like glassdoor.com, salary.com, indeed.com, there are sites like h1bdata.info. So there are lots of data points, but again, these are all not representative data. This is self-disclosed data by employees uh, who like to brag about themselves. So you sometimes the data is not consistent, they are wrong, they're misleading. Um, and only a small percent, the top, maybe 10% or 20% of people disclose data points and others do not disclose data points because they are not comfortable with it. So vendors have to work with companies directly and source all the data points for the role and anonymize it, unlike the online databases. So again, next time you look at an online database, understand that the data you get there probably reflects only a small percent of the market. So if you go to Indeed, you will find that Software engineering interns are getting $138,000 a year. Um, and uh, software engineers are making $153,000 a year. So all these are self-disclosed data points. Uh, it's absolutely not true. A lot of software engineers make 100K, they make $110,000, $120,000 in big tech companies. So these are data points you see here, uh, not representative. And there's always a spread which is well right to this green bar out here and also to the left of this green bar out here. So there's always a distribution. So look at it in terms of spread. It's not one single number. Compensation is never one single number. Okay, so when it comes to the spread, again, it depends on which job level it is and which job category it belongs to. The spread is nothing but the maximum minus minimum number divided by the minimum. So that's really the spread. So a recommended spread is typically around 50%. Remember I talked to you about the pay grade saying that uh, the maximum is around 120% of the midpoint number and uh, the minimum is the like 80% of the midpoint number. So this, if you calculate the spread, it's uh, 1.2 minus 0.8 divided by 0.8. So it's 0.4 by 0.8, which is 50%. So 50% is recommended but it can vary a lot more. For example, for top management, the spread could vary from 60 to 120%. Um, and it, uh, some managerial jobs, it could vary from 35 to 60%. For office jobs, it varies from 10 to 25%. So the biggest takeaway from the slide is that in standardized typical jobs, everybody's paid pretty much the same. And there's not too much of spread, but as it gets to top management, where you can make a lot of difference to the bottom line of the company, you tend to get recognized a lot more. So there's a lot of spread in terms of compensation. So again, the higher you go, the larger the spread, the greater the chance of you getting paid a lot more. So one question which I frequently get is that why do companies pay a lot more for new hires? So this basically refers to a phenomenon called compression. So compression is a situation where newcomers get paid a lot more than old timers. For example, if you take um, professors in business schools or in academia, what's happening right now is that newcomers who join as faculty members in business schools, 
are getting paid way more than faculty members who are full professors and who have spent 20 to 30 years working in their space. Is that fair? It's not fair, but you've got to respond to the market and you have to pay what it takes to get good talent. So if you're sticking around in a company for more than two to three years, over time, your compensation, the, the amount of increase you get per year is definitely much lesser than what you get in the market outside. So over time, if you keep sticking around, yes, compensation will decrease. So the more time you spend in a company, if you spend decades in a company, there's a very high chance that your compensation is well below the midpoint because the external market tends to rise a lot higher compared to uh, the typical increases you get from within companies. So many companies tend to give stock and equity. So that's a way to balance the inequity in terms of the difference between internal employees and external hires. But that's only happens in say tech companies in the Bay Area or in tech hubs, not in every company. So seniority is important, um, but again, too much seniority also begins to hurt you beyond a point. There are some companies which basically says that um, if, for example, you're joining a very traditional tech company, which has been around for a long time, but not part of the FAN group, they may actually say that for new hires, um, we will not pay much um, and we will we'll expect you to just join the company and uh, pick up on the brand, put that on your resume, which will make it much better for you on the long run. So some companies say that because the company brand is so much, uh, we don't want to encourage compression. We will pay new hires lower. Uh, but the other company that says, no, it, uh, no, we want the best talent available in the market. We are going to pay them higher. So again, there's a lot of variability in terms of how companies approach it. There's a lot of competitive pressure in the market. Uh, the, for example, if you're in the Bay Area or a place like Bangalore in India, it's so, so difficult to hire. It is even more difficult than say 10 years back or 20 years back because uh, work opportunities have gone up dramatically. There are a lot more companies, there's a lot more competition for talent. So the competitive pressure is forcing employees to pay a lot more for talent. Internal equity is important. Uh, typically the recruiting manager or the HR uh, manager are gonna look at uh, internal equity. We don't want to typically pay um, new hires something way more than what the existing employees or people with more seniority get paid. Uh, but there could be cases where new hires get paid more. So it's all again, it, there is no fixed way to look at this. It all depends on the competitive pressures, uh, how much the gap is in terms of how much seniority is valued in the company, are they adding value and so on. So it's a very complicated conversation and there's no single way to look at it. So the other things um, which are important is that when it comes to annual compensation benchmarking exercises, companies typically give a standard increase for everyone who falls within the minimum and maximum of the range. But you also see that there are employees who probably are below the minimum and some employees are above the maximum. The reason why people fall below the minimum is because uh, if, people work in traditional companies like manufacturing or food processing and so on. Uh, if they join maybe a tech company, their base compensation was already low to begin with. And even if they get a big bump in pay, it's a big bump on top of a low base salary. So uh, that means that they could still be below the minimum for that number. So when people get into companies, uh, you need to make sure that you negotiate the right way because um, if you do not, you could end up being below the minimum, especially if you come from a non-traditional industry to the, say, a tech company. Likewise, uh, you could be paid well above the maximum if you're a fantastic performer, you do, you're hitting the ball out of the park in terms of what you do in the workplace and the value you bring. Yes, you could get paid a lot more. Typically, what HR would recommend is that if you're being paid above the maximum, we would strongly recommend to the manager to promote this person rather than keep them in the same role. So green circles, what happens during the annual compensation exercises that HR would recommend that if, for example, the average increase in that year for everybody who's marked blue is say two to 3%, we would add maybe another 2% for people who are marked green. So the green marked employees would 
we expected to get maybe a five to six percent increase instead of a two to three percent increase. This is just to make sure that over time they tend to catch up with the blue employees and get into that blue box. But the problem is every year, as the people in blue also get a 2% increase, their numbers are also going to shift to the right-hand side. But that's why we give a higher increase to people who are marked green so that over time, they'll end up in the blue box. Likewise, if somebody is getting compensated very well and is marked red and above the, the range, we would typically not give them an increase. And we would basically say that, nope, there is no increase for this person in terms of cost of living or end of the year adjustments so that we want them to fall into the blue bucket over time. So again, that's why we really recommend that people don't stay in the red zone for too long and they get promoted because uh, it makes it very, very difficult during compensation calculations. So what's happening of late in the tech industry is that there's a concept called broadbanding, which means that Companies are understanding that too many pay grades, too many levels in a company ends up creating its own set of share issues and problems. People are demotivated. They only want to focus on promotions and they don't end up helping each other. So they want more of, uh, companies want more collaboration and people helping each other. So what's happened is that many companies are trying to de-layer the organization, make it flatter. So there are less positions inside the company and they want to decrease the competitive pressure and make sure that employees focus on building their skills. For example, you could work in a company like Google or Facebook and be called a software engineer if you're entering the workforce after college. And you could still be a software engineer 20 years of, after 20 years of work or even after 30 years of work. So yes, the, the software engineers with 20 years of work experience or 30 years of work experience are getting paid a lot more, but their title is still gonna be the same. So companies are tending to make it more flat in terms of having just maybe two to three layers within an organization instead of having like 10 to 15 layers. Okay, so compa ratio, uh, the, one of the big takeaways from this conversation is that try to understand what the compa ratio is. If you ever get feedback that your compa ratio is below 100%, then you are getting paid below market. Um, it could there could be valid reasons why you're getting paid below market, but understand that as you gain more experience and skills, either the company or in is going to move you to the midpoint or above the midpoint, or you could always get a job outside and you could get a job which pays above the midpoint. If you're getting paid 100% of the compa ratio or a compa ratio of one, it means that you're right at the midpoint. And uh, if you're getting paid well above the compa ratio, that means that um, that's fantastic news for you. But again, you also need to perform dramatically well because if you don't perform, I mean, your job could be online when it comes to the next restructuring effort. So as you go from a compa ratio less than one to a compa ratio more than one, it's it takes many years to go through that and it requires you to gain specific skill sets. And after you reach the point where you touch the maximum of the compa ratio, there's a high chance that you could get promoted. And uh, um, that would be the HR recommendation that let's not keep that person in that same position and the red zone above the maximum for the number for too long. This, this is my last slide, but I wanted to say that while I focused on compensation so far, it's very important to note that compensation by itself will not retain employees. So there's a very, very famous experiment called, uh, it's called the Herzberg theory of uh, motivators and demotivators. And what this means is that compensation is something called the hygiene factor, which means that if you pay somebody well, that means that they will not be dissatisfied, but it will not ensure that the person will be satisfied because Compensation is not directly linked to satisfaction. It is linked to dissatisfaction in the sense that if you underpay, yes, the person is dissatisfied, but paying a person more doesn't mean automatically that the person would be satisfied. The only way satisfaction can happen is when the work is good, you got a good manager, you feel that you're adding value, you have a sense of achievement, you feel that your strengths are being encouraged, you're playing to your strengths, and you feel that you're being recognized. So never base all your decisions just on compensation. 
there are co companies even among the fang companies which pay extremely well but uh, they treat their employees horribly so try to understand the culture of the company be in a company where your skills are valued and your strengths are valued because ultimately that is the only way you will work towards gaining skills in the workplace and that's the easy way to grow and even if you are underpaid in your company it's only a matter of time before the company promotes you or gives you higher compensation or you can always go out and get higher compensation but at the end of the day you need to have the right skills and the skills will only happen if you have the ability to learn and uh, handle more responsibility so be in companies which value you do not allow compensation to be the sole determinant of uh, which company you're going to join versus which company you will not join and when you're leaving companies don't leave for companies if they give you maybe a 2% increase or a 5% increase because um, it's just not worth it i would just say that typically when you leave a company and join a new company try to choose companies which give you at least a 15 to 20% increase otherwise it's just not worth losing your network in earlier company for a new company anyway these are all thumb rules i'm trying to just throw up before you based on me having worked worked with thousands of applicants and candidates in the past many years let me know what do you think about the video so if you have questions feel free to comment i will be happy to answer them and before you leave press the like and subscribe buttons because um, it gives me a good idea of how many people have watched the video and what is it they liked thanks everyone appreciate your time bye